Would you have guessed the rightful King of Gondor once ran with Leatherface? Or that one of America's most beloved Oscar-winning actors was in a movie that earned a rare 0% on Rotten Tomatoes? Let's take a look at stars you never knew started out in low-budget horror films. Despite a renewed look at the Texas Chainsaw Massacre franchise due to both the advent of streaming and continued sequels and prequels, horror fans remain divided on Leatherface, Texas Chainsaw Massacre 3. To be fair, few would know how to follow up Toby Hooper's zany offbeat sequel to his own 1974 game-changing original, The Texas Chainsaw Massacre. In the director's chair this time around is Jeff Burr, who helmed sequels in The Stepfather, Pumpkinhead, and Puppet Master franchises. The year is 1990, and New Line Cinema has the reins on Leatherface and the dysfunctional Sawyer family, which now boasts new clan members. Among them is Tex, played by Viggo Mortensen with zeal. Tex nails the final girl's hands to a chair, threatens rape by Leatherface, and throws temper tantrums before understandably losing a fight with Ken Foray and getting overheated. But a little fire never hurt the American actor. He would later fight on behalf of the free creatures of Middle-earth in Peter Jackson's Lord of the Rings trilogy, and fight nude in a bathhouse in David Cronenberg's Eastern Promises. That's only two among a slew of other memorable performances. Yeah, right? I'm good. Before Friends and Office Space, American sweetheart Jennifer Aniston called upon the luck of the Irish to battle evil in Leprechaun. Aniston starred opposite Warwick Davis in the 1993 horror film about a knee-high killer seeking his pot of gold at any cost. Oh, come on, let him go chase rainbows. Let's you and I go paint. After a man named O'Grady returns to the U.S. with the titular Leprechaun's treasure, the Leprechaun follows and gets trapped in a basement. Then, it's up to Aniston's character Tori to somehow escape the jokey murderer's first of many sprees once he's released. Unfortunately, Aniston wouldn't make it into space as the franchise kept churning out sequels. One Leprechaun was enough. How does Aniston remember the experience? She told Howard Stern, I watched it like eight years ago with our mutual friend Justin Thoreau for shits and giggles. We were dating. It was one of those things when I tried to get that remote out of his hand and there was just no having it. He was like, no, 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 this is happening. Aniston isn't the only actor to find success in low-budget horror worlds, but seems to have more of a reaction than others. Leprechaun is a cult classic now, but don't expect Aniston to list it atop her career accomplishments. Not many people can say that their feature film debut took place in the second film in history to win all five of the major categories at the Academy Awards. However, for Christopher Lloyd, who played Max Tabor in One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, that is precisely what happened. The sky was the limit for Lloyd, but only five years after his cinematic debut, he seemingly took a step backward in the eyes of many by appearing in the ultra-low-budget horror film Schizoid. Likely cast due to his cuckoo's nest connection, Lloyd played a creepy handyman named Gilbert, attending group therapy hosted by Dr. Peter Fales, when suddenly all of his patients find themselves stalked by a scissor-wielding slasher. Written and directed by David Paulson of Dynasty and Dallas fame, Schizoid was not well received upon its release. During an episode of Sneak Previews, legendary critics Gene Siskel and Roger Ebert lambasted the film's misogyny, going as far as to call it gruesome and despicable. Lloyd spent the next five years acting in westerns and forgettable dramas, until 1985 when he would nab the role of Doc Brown in Back to the Future that would change his life forever. A heartthrob like Brad Pitt is the perfect physical specimen for a killer in hiding, and that's exactly who he played in 1989. Cutting Class features Pitt as Bad Boy Dwight, who competes with recently released mental hospital patient Brian for a young girl's affection. The film becomes a whodunit that wants you to guess the murderer between Dwight and Brian. The production uses a body double during slasher sequences, so it's impossible to detect Dwight or Brian's figure. Pitt hasn't mentioned cutting class in quite some time, so there are no recent tidbits about whether or not starting in horror gave him any advantage. Pitt did, however, become romantically coupled with co-star Jill Sholin, leading to an engagement but no marriage. Cutting Class isn't exactly a classic of the horror-comedy subgenre, which might be why no one's clamoring for Pitt's decades-old opinion. Still, the film is worth checking out, just for curiosity's sake. Not that Pitt needs any support in getting fans to watch him on screen. Come on! He's saved Private Ryan. He's been a castaway. He's been down the green mile and the road to perdition. Like a long-distance runner who seemingly never runs out of energy and will, he keeps on trucking, picking up Oscars and numerous other accolades along the way. Looking back on his illustrious career, it seems that Tom Hanks really has done it all. This is especially true when you realize that he was even a potential victim in the deep-cut 1980 slasher, He Knows You're Alone. Coming out of the shockwave sent by John Carpenter's Halloween just a couple of years prior, Armand Mastroianni's directorial 
directorial debut capitalized on slasher formulas set around a single theme. In this case, weddings. As a bride-to-be is hunted by a blade-wielding maniac in the weeks before the big ceremony, Hanks appears as an aw-shucks acquaintance of hers named Elliot. He goes on a tangent about the thrill of roller coasters and horror movies, saying, It's safe. You can leave the movie or get off the ride with a vicarious thrill and the feeling that you just conquered death. One hell of a first-class ride. Slightly obnoxious, but technically correct and likable, Hanks Elliot predates the genre expert Randy Meeks of Scream by a decade and a half. Thankfully, he has spared the knife, but the same can't be said of his co-stars. Leonardo DiCaprio may be one of Hollywood's premier leading men, but the former teen heartthrob didn't actually have his feature film debut in the Academy Award-nominated What's Eating Gilbert Grape, as many assume. That honor was reserved for the low-budget horror film Critters 3. Currently boasting an impressive 0% on Rotten Tomatoes, Critters 3 was directed by Christine Peterson and was the first in the film's franchise to not take place in its usual setting of Grover's Bend. As goofy as this direct-to-video sequel about furry aliens destroying the world is, DiCaprio delivers some genuine emotional depth as Josh. He's stepson of a corrupt landlord who eventually gets eaten by the Krites and the love interest of the film's protagonist, Annie. When he discovers he's accidentally trapped his stepfather in a room with the aliens, his reaction gives the audience a preview of the superstardom awaiting him in the future. A good actor is a good actor, regardless of the material. DiCaprio himself described his role, your average, no-depth, standard kid with blonde hair. But his obvious talent added some unexpected nuance to the ridiculous world of Critters 3. The same year he verbally sparred with Alicia Silverstone in Clueless, Paul Rudd, aka Ant-Man, went toe-to-toe -to -toe with the boogeyman himself. Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers sees Paul Stephen Rudd assuming the role of Tommy Doyle, one of the two children Laurie Strode babysits in the original Halloween. Bright-eyed and neurotic, a clearly traumatized Doyle is the only person other than Dr. Loomis who understands just how evil Michael Myers is. And soon, very soon, he'll come home to kill again. He spends the rest of the movie stalking his neighbor, taking care of a baby he found in a bathroom, and depending on which cut of the film is playing, beating the life out of Michael Myers with a pipe. No pim particles required. Not only does George Clooney claim the honor of appearing on this list, but he dies a slasher victim's death in 1987's Return to Horror High. The film is Clooney's official low-budget horror debut, where he plays an actor starring in some filmmaker's exploitation thriller that uses the abandoned location of actual murders. Clooney's performer plays a cop investigating fake murders in the real Crippen High School, where he's offed by what most presume is the original killer's second act. Clooney only makes it about 12 minutes into Return to Horror High before he's attacked off-screen and fatally dispatched. There's not much gore beyond Clooney's blood-stained face pressed against a classroom door's window, which speaks to the film's lower budget. He doesn't get an excessively gratuitous exit, just some yelps and gurgles before a stabbing noise clues viewers into the method of assassination. Who knew the actor who plays a failed actor would eventually become one of Hollywood's most popular megastars? Keira Knightley has made a name for herself as the queen of the prestige period piece and big blockbuster pirate fair. But the same year she played a decoy for Queen Amidala in Star Wars Episode I, The Phantom Menace, Knightley was cast in British indie horror The Hole. The project was an adaptation of Guy Burt's short YA horror novel, After The Hole, from 1993. Keira Knightley was 16 years old at the time and starred as Frankie. At that point in her career, Knightley was a relative unknown. She'd worked on a handful of other productions, but always in bit parts. This was her first major role, and she loved getting to explore the character's duality. She said around the film's release, Frankie is a real bitch, so she was fantastic to play. She's sparky, fun, and headstrong. The movie is more than 20 years old at this point, but it's still worth going into it as fresh as possible. Suffice to say, there are two sides to the story, and the twist is pitch black. Knightley is a big part of that. A gory Cronenberg-esque relic of the VHS horror era, Parasite might not necessarily have an enduring legacy, though it was a moderate hit upon its 1982 release. There's plenty to love about this bloody post-apocalyptic creature feature, namely Demi Moore's second on-screen appearance. Set after an atomic event in the not-too-distant future, Parasite tells the story of a shady government entity called The Merchants. They employ Dr. Paul Dean to genetically engineer parasitic creatures to feed off of the humans that survived. This allows the merchants to take control of their remaining citizens, reducing the risk of apocalyptic lawlessness. 
That is, until the parasites themselves become too dangerous to be controlled. Moore plays Patricia, a lemon farmer who teams up with a newly infected Dean to try and stop the parasitic spread. Her occupation and the constant visual motif of lemons tease that the citric fruit could have factored into the defeat of the blood-sucking entities. Although it turns out that good old-fashioned sonic blasts and red-hot flames will do the trick. While the plot of Parasite might not be the most creative form of horror, its gnarly practical effects and no-holds-barred attitude towards blood and guts make it worth seeking out. After all, who isn't curious about the prospect of Demi Moore as a lemon farmer in a veritable nuclear wasteland? Patricia Arquette has played a wide variety of roles over the years. She was terrifying as Dee Dee Blanchard on Hulu's The Act, adorable as Alabama Worley in True Romance, and inspiring as ghost whisperer Allison on Medium. Arquette has dabbled in the stranger side of cinema as well, working with David Lynch on Lost Highway and Martin Scorsese on his psychological drama film Bringing Out the Dead. But before she did any of those, she faced off against one of the scariest movie monsters of all, Freddy Krueger. Arquette's very first role was in A Nightmare on Elm Street 3, Dream Warriors, playing the lead role of Kristen Parker, a teenage girl whose nightmares are haunted by Freddy. She teams up with her new therapist and Freddy's former victim, Nancy Thompson, to try and stop the murderous monster once and for all. Dream Warriors is beloved by both critics and fans alike, with two fabulous final girls teaming up to finally finish Freddy, at least until the next sequel. Arquette is excellent in her film debut and shows exactly the kind of skill that she'll display throughout the rest of her prolific career. Even if slashers aren't your jam, Dream Warriors is one of the best. Julia Louis-Dreyfus is one funny lady, but before she was yucking it up as Elaine on Seinfeld or making politics palatable as the Vice President of the United States on Veep, she had a bit role in a 1980s cult horror classic. Her very first movie role was in Troll in 1986, playing a young woman who becomes possessed by the spirit of an ancient troll and starts behaving like a wood nymph. She dances around her apartment in the nude, with some carefully placed leaves to keep things PG-13, but doesn't really do much else. She's one of the many characters in the apartment complex who fall under the spell of the troll. However, the main focus is on the Potter family, whose daughter Wendy Ann is the first to be bewitched. Eventually son Harry Potter, yes, his name's Harry Potter, finds a good witch in the building, and they are able to fight the troll's malicious magic. Troll is a wild and weird B-movie that's as much fantasy as it is horror, and it's perfect for Louis Dreyfus because it also has plenty of laughs. Though her career would almost entirely stick to comedy after she found fame, Troll proves that she can do a little bit of everything. Okay, I get that. I respect that. About a year before cutting a rug and breaking jaws at the Enchantment Under the Sea dance in Back to the Future, Crispin Glover was body dropping at the hands of one of horror's most iconic killers. Pamela Voorhees' hockey mask wearing undead son Jason is four films deep into the extensive Friday the 13th franchise by this point. The latest crop of fresh blood is made up of more sexed up teens looking to party, plus a baby faced Corey Feldman. Director Frank Zito pulled from his Rolodex and brought in the Prowler SFX makeup maestro Tom Savini to handle the body count and kill his own SFX creation of Jason Voorhees. Among Savini's gorier works is the death of Crispin Glover's fumbling character Jimmy, who ventures into the kitchen for a bottle of wine. In a scene shot in reverse for more effect on the impact, Jimmy takes a corkscrew to the hand and a cleaver to the face, twitching and all. Thanks to his run on the Emmy Award-winning Schitt's Creek, Dan Levy has become one of the most well-liked actors in the industry. The son of legendary Canadian comedy actor Eugene Levy, Dan obviously had some advantages breaking into the industry. Still, the former host of Canada's MTV Live got his start in film the way so many others do, by starring in a low-budget horror movie. In 2012, Levy starred alongside Misha Barton in the Lifetime thriller Cyberstalker. Barton plays a woman named Aiden Ashley, whose life was ripped apart when an online stalker showed up at her home and murdered her parents 13 years earlier. After that, she wisely stays offline for a long time, but when she ends up promoting a showing of her work at an art gallery online, the stalking begins again. So, she hires Dan Levy's character Jack Dayton, a cybersecurity professional, to investigate. In a not-so-shocking turn of events, the wheelchair-using Jack Dayton is revealed to have been the cyberstalker all along, and the person responsible for killing Aiden Ashley family and friends. Yes, that means that David Rose of Schitt's Creek made his film debut playing a slasher villain. When asked for a short review of his film debut on an episode of the popular web series Hot Ones, Levy said, It's bad. How about that? And if I was allowed a third word, it's very bad. Yes. Yes, it is. 
Funnily enough, seasoned comedian Seth Rogen's first film role was in Donnie Darko, the 2001 surrealist horror drama that would make his co-star Jake Gyllenhaal a household name. While the actor technically had his debut as Ken on the Judd Apatow-produced TV show Freaks and Geeks back in 1999, his small role in Donnie Darko heralded the first of many film performances for Rogan. He played Ricky Danforth, one of the titular character's many high school bullies. Still, his part ended up taking a backseat to the demented Frank, a man in a very sinister-looking bunny suit who follows Donnie around. Whether Frank is a mere figment of Donnie's imagination or a personal tragic omen remains unclear. Don't turn to Rogan for deeper insight, though. In an interview with Collider ahead of the release of 2007's Knocked Up, Rogan admits to still not grasping what exactly went down in Donnie Darko. He claims he didn't know back then and still doesn't know now, but all that matters to him is that he had a good time making the film. So, Donnie Darko may have been one of Rogan's rare dramatic pursuits, but his ability to have fun on set was one and the same with his subsequent comedic ventures. Jack Nicholson has played many horrific characters over the years, from Jack Torrance in The Shining to the actual devil in The Witches of Eastwick. So it shouldn't be all that much of a surprise that he got his start in horror. It also shouldn't be any more surprising to find out that it was the great Roger Corman who gave the future A-list star his start. One of Nicholson's first appearances was as the masochistic dental patient Wilbur Force in the original The Little Shop of Horrors. He brought eager, manic energy to the guy who gets off on dental pain. It's quite an off-putting performance, by the way. It might be an early indicator of the madman we see in The Shining. Nicholson would then star in The Terror for Roger Corman, but it was his less than three minutes on screen in The Little Shop of Horrors that really made audiences sit up and take notice for the first time. Bill Paxton's first starring role was in a 1983 cheapo horror movie called Mortuary, which sees the charismatic young actor playing the bad guy, a creepy young man who works as an embalmer for the local mortuary. He's weird even when he's just himself, but he's also depicted as a ghoulish hooded figure stalking the main character. Horror once again underlines its importance in being Hollywood's talent scout here, as Paxton was given all the room to be broad, theatrical, and effectively creepy in this early outing. Considering he always seems to have a foot in both the comedy and genre worlds, it makes sense that Paxton's talents were well-suited for this first low-budget horror picture. This $850,000 movie might not be regarded as a classic, but it is an early showcase for Paxton, who really swings for the fences, leaning full-on into the camp movie he's in. In 1999, Hilary Swank impressed the world with her performance as transgender man Brandon Tina in Kimberly Pierce's harrowing Boys Don't Cry. It was a performance that shocked many who only knew Swank for her roles on the teen drama Beverly Hills 90210 or her breakout performance in The Next Karate Kid. While Swank is known now as a remarkably talented dramatic actor, many forget that she got her cinematic start in Buffy the Vampire Slayer. The 1992 feature-length predecessor of the popular television series of the same name, Buffy leaned heavily into the world of camp cinema, with Swank's performance as Kimberly Hanna being one of the standout roles. As one of Buffy's sidekick best friends, Swank doesn't get a whole lot of screen time, but she absolutely made the best of every second she was given. Sure, Deadly Blessing may not be Wes Craven's most acclaimed horror film, but it is distinct for two glorious reasons. For starters, it's the first prominent film role of future Hollywood femme fatale Sharon Stone. It also features a wardrobe that New York Times critic Janet Maslin described as six months worth of lounging pajamas. Honestly, what more can one possibly desire from their viewing experience? As it turns out, critics still aren't entirely satisfied by an abundance of negligees and beautiful women. The 1981 horror film focuses on an isolated community of people known as Hittites, a sect so conservative they allegedly make the Amish look like swingers. Martha married a former Hittite, but they still live in close proximity to the community on their farm. When Martha's husband is mysteriously killed, her LA friends arrive for the funeral and an extended visit. As it turns out, an ancient Hittite incubus might just be the cause of the recent violence, and the arrival of these beautiful women might just exacerbate things. Stone's role is minor, but her stunning looks make her on-screen presence totally magnetic. It would be over a decade before she played the salacious, white-dressed donning Catherine Trammell in Paul Verhoeven's 1992 erotic thriller, Basic Instinct. As the saying goes, good things come to those who wait. Haley Bennett's name isn't associated much with horror anymore. She's become a star attached to everything from awards contenders like Cyrano to blockbusters like the upcoming Borderlands. That's after finding a career in horror titles like The Hole, Christy, and after facing her childhood fears by accepting the titular role in The Haunting of Molly Hartley. 
Starring alongside a mop-haired Chase Crawford, Bennett tries to escape PTSD by starting over at a new school. Then the supernatural interferes. Suffice it to say, the role of Molly Hartley was recast in 2015's extremely lesser-known sequel, The Exorcism of Molly Hartley. Is no franchise safe from studio continuations? Bennett told Interview Magazine in 2008, I'm pretty mad at horror films for ruining my childhood. A single viewing of 1990's It caused Bennett to redecorate her bedroom without visible clowns. When asked why she chose horror-centric roles as a young professional, Bennett said, Playing Molly in The Haunting of Molly Hartley was the ultimate challenge. There's nothing like exposure therapy in the form of paranormal frights and bloody guts to shake your fears. Not to say Bennett's had any ideas about returning to horror since, but her path through slashers and hauntings has led to extraordinary heights. I need to move on. Many horror fans remember the 1988 movie Monkey Shines for its offbeat direction by George Romero or its use of primate performers. But it should also be known for introducing the world to two amazing character actors, Stanley Tucci and Stephen Root. The movie stars Jason Begay as Alan Mann, a law student who is rendered quadriplegic after an accident. He eventually gets a service animal to help him, a Capuchin monkey who has been given a special brain serum to make her as smart as a human. As Alan and his monkey begin to bond, things get really weird. Root plays Dean Burbage, who pushes the scientists doing the monkey experiments to more extreme results. At the time, he was a relatively well-known stage performer, but had never done much TV or film. Tucci plays Dr. John Wiseman, a spinal surgeon who gives Begay a second opinion on his injury, plus an unsolicited one about the hair on his derriere. Both men would go on to have incredible careers. Seeing them show up in anything automatically makes that piece of media more entertaining. So it's pretty amazing that they both got their start in a weird little horror flick about a mind-melding monkey. Check out one of our newest videos right here. Plus, even more slash film videos about your favorite stuff are coming soon. Subscribe to our YouTube channel and hit the bell so you don't miss a single one.